Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, Libertarian Alliance. Today, Dr. John Lester is going to give a talk on a paper called A Critical Commentary on uh, Walensky's... Uh, uh, <laughs> beg your pardon. Zwolinsk. Zwolinsky's uh, 2013 Libertarianism and Liberalism and uh, Liberty. That general, um, so, the reason that Matt Zwolinsky is interesting and important is because he founded uh, the Bleeding Heart Libertarians, which you can find online. And the idea of Bleeding Heart Libertarianism is that um, libertarians ought to be concerned with welfare. And many of the people on the Bleeding Heart Libertarian list uh, are libertarians, but an awful lot of them aren't. Uh, for instance, they say that there's a they have a lot of discussions on things like universal basic income. Now, to say I'm a libertarian who believes in universal basic income provided by the state sounds to me like saying I'm a libertarian who believes that the state ought to stone all adulterers. Uh, you're not a libertarian. You might like certain libertarian ideas, but something like that is simply completely incompatible. Uh, now, a couple of odd things about Zwolinski. Firstly, he certainly isn't a libertarian, and he doesn't know what libertarian is. I mean, I, 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 I explain libertarianism as a subset of classical liberalism. You're, a, you're, a, you're, an, you're an anarchist or a minimal, minimal statist. That's a sort of necessary but not sufficient condition, you know, but for, for the purpose of maximizing liberty or promoting liberty or def protecting liberty in some way. Uh, Zwolinski is not a minimal statist. Uh, I recently uh, did exchange a few words online with him and I pointed this out to him and he, he, his, his attitude was more or less was that it, well, this was a bit of an academic distinction I was making, which, given that he is an academic, is a bit of a strange thing for him to say as, as an objection to the point I was making. But anyway, so not only is he not a libertarian, and he doesn't intend to change the title anytime soon, uh, but he implicitly rejects libertarianism philosophically in the sense that he more or less swallows everything that Will Kim Licker has said about libertarianism from the philosophical point of view and says what Kim Licker says. If you say, ask him about libertarianism, philosophically, what Kim Licker says. But at the same time, he wants to call himself a libertarianism, sorry, a libertarian, and say that liberty is important. But if what Kim Licker said about libertarianism is right, I'm not sure what it means to say liberty is important. But anyway, that's the background of it. And on that basis, he was invited to give a lot of talks on the Cato Institute website, uh, which includes libertarianism.org. And he was explaining libertarianism or, and his criticisms of libertarianism. And uh, um, I took it upon myself to uh, reply to these, which I did on the website, but this is a, a revised version. So this is a critical commentary on Zwolinski's Liberty and Property Essays on Libertarianism.org. Uh, and I will uh, quote his titles for each section throughout. So Libertarianism and Liberty, Part 1, A Complicated Relationship. All later, although later going on to reject it, the essay first suggests, what else could define a commitment to libertarianism other than a belief in liberty? What sets libertarians apart is their belief that liberty is the highest political ideal. Uh, there are several immediate problems overlooked in that essay with the idea of having a commitment to the view that, libertarian, that sorry, liberty is the highest political value. Uh, firstly, we can't be committed to any view in the sense that uh, whatever we believe is true or moral simply is revealed to us by introspection and not a choice, it's not a commitment. So a perceived refutation can stop us holding a view at any time. Secondly, 
although possibly pedantically, liberty is not a value. Values only exist in people's minds, but it's a concept or a state of affairs that might or might not be valued. Third, libertarianism is, in one sense, not political, but anti-political in principle. And fourth, libertarianism is not even necessarily even the highest principle that a libertarian holds. A libertarian principle might be held to be inviolable, but even that does not entail that it is the highest principle. If it is held for modus vivendi reasons, for instance, as it usually is to some extent at least, then all the participants might have other principles that they would personally rank higher or value more than the libertarian principle. However, they realize that liberty is a safer way to promote those other principles than the use of aggression. The essay's interpretation then begins. Let's look at one popular and superficially plausible interpretation, what it means to hold liberty as the highest political value on this view is to hold that liberty ought to be maximized. Before jumping into issues of maximization, should we not first ask, what is the best theory of libertarian liberty? Otherwise, whether or not it can or should be maximized cannot be answered. One theory is that it's the absence of proactive impositions, but there are others. It continues, I am unable to think of a single libertarian philosopher who defends a position like the one, like the one I am describing. Uh, in fact, uh, in uh, Escape from Leviathan, somebody argues that libertarianism entails maximizing liberty. Why would a libertarian accept less liberty if more were possible? However, it also defends a version of rule libertarianism rather than act libertarianism as a general rule. Don't violate liberty, even when it looks as though greater liberty can thereby be achieved because it doesn't work in the long run. He then continues about the concerns of freedom of employees. And we are told of the myriad ways in which coercion infests our present system. There is considerable confusion about coercion among libertarians. Many of them use coercion as meaning only whatever is unlibertarian. However, libertarians cannot be against coercion as such, because in plain English it means interpersonal force or the threat of force, uh, and thus is inevitable. They can, uh, libertarians can only be against coercion that violates liberty. They can't be against coercion that enforces liberty or is voluntarily or contractually accepted. Thus, coercion is stated to be often to the benefit of employers and to the detriment of labourers. And here he's following uh, Rod Long to a certain extent. Uh, and this uh, might well be so, but the crucial point must be distinguished and not lost. Insofar as the state does not impose rules that flout liberty, then the standard libertarian response, whatever restrictions employees approach upon their employers, employers employ, uh, impose upon their employees, do not actually count as a violation of their freedom in the relevant sense. This is correct, but it cuts both ways. Whatever restrictions employees impose upon their employers do not count as violations of liberty. Sorry. <coughs> because this doesn't amplify, does it? It just records, yeah. right, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, things might have been clearer had Zwolinski an explicit theory of liberty, but he doesn't. And that absence helps to cause uh, confusion like this. Suppose I ask you to lock me in your dungeon and throw away the key, perhaps in exchange for your writing a check to my child, who I would otherwise be unable to support. However unimpeachable the contract may be on procedural terms, I am, once locked away in your dungeon, less free than I was when I was, well, free. Libertarians might be right in thinking that there is nothing morally wrong with the lack of freedom that I now endure, but to infer from this that, I'm, that it must not be lack of freedom after all 
is an abuse of language and logic. Now, this is a mistake that no libertarian ought to make. The sense of liberty or freedom as the absence of mere physical constraint is completely different from the libertarian sense of not being aggressively constrained by another person or organization. Once vol voluntarily incarcerated, someone lacks physical freedom or liberty, but he has suffered no loss of interpersonal libertarian freedom or liberty if he contracted into it. There is no abuse of language and logic in making this clear distinction. The abuse is conflating two conceptually distinct homonyms. This error is compounded by the interpretation of the fundamental problem with this line of argument uh, being its reliance on what philosophers called a moralized conception of liberty. And some libertarians are indeed confused in just this way. But there is no need to mention morals at all. Libertarian liberty has an objective content, both theoretically and in its observance. It is an entirely separate matter whether such liberty or its observance is moral. Of criminals, we are similarly told, punishing them by imprisonment might not be unjust. But surely this, this does not mean that the criminal is, all appearance to the con contrary, perfectly free. The criminal's physical liberty has been reduced, but his libertarian liberty has not been infringed to the extent that the judicial system has only engaged in reactively or defensively rectifying his infringements of the libertarian liberty of others. And that ought not to appear paradoxical or unclear. The problem, according to Zwilinski, is that freedom and justice are both important values, but we should reject to resist the temptation to, to suppose that they are the same value. In fact, libertarian liberty and freedom of action and justice are three distinguishable concepts and state of affairs. However, if the libertarian compatibility thesis is, tr is true, then liberty can systematically be compatible with justice and human welfare in their practical applications. Libertarianism and liberty part two, against maximum freedom. We are first told that it is because the treatment of fate of any particular individual is of no deci decisive relevance for the utilitarian Philosophers objected that utilitarianism fails to take seriously the separateness of persons. This failure is true in theory, but not in practice. Analogously, libertarianism fails to take seriously the suffering of persons in theory, but not in practice. For the most part, the classical liberals did not see a clash between liberty and utility, and they were right. We are then told that the view that justice consists in maximizing liberty is subject to precisely the same objection, the sacrifice of some person's, uh, some person's freedom for the benefit of others, so long as the net result in, is positive. But if rule utilitarianism is true, then the problem is not a practical one for libertarianism. And libertarianism can be advanced as a practical ideology, not as one for all logically possible worlds. However, according to Zwolinski, when dealing with potentially dangerous individuals, then on the maximizing view, there is no principal objection to imprisoning an innocent person, X, merely on the grounds that X is deemed likely to commit some offense in the future. If person X is known to be a significant and serious danger to others, perhaps by past crimes, or how could we know, then such a person proactively imposes on us, even if he enters our private streets without our permission. So we could, at the very least, exclude him uh, uh, from our private streets in self-defense. 
And if he is a serious enough danger, then incarceration is theoretically possible in self-defense. Therefore, there's no real problem uh, posed here. The essay accepts, this is Zerinsky's essay, that a defender of the maximizing view might argue that such trade-offs are unlikely to be beneficial in the real world, but objects that it is precisely the same response that a utilitarian might make to the charges of injustice that we have leveled against his theory. And yet the utilitarian's response is in practice adequate if he is a rule preference utilitarian who embraces rule utilitarianism as the right rule to that end. It is a weak argument to attack merely logically possible faults, but that is what philosophers often do with both libertarianism and utilitarianism. Libertarianism and liberty, part three. It doesn't add up. There is more great confusion about libertarianism on the assertion that abolition did, of course, increase the freedom of slaves. But it also diminished the freedom of certain non-slaves. Specifically, it diminished the freedom of slave owners. This is Zwilinski's opinion. It diminished the license, the aggressive constraints or proactive impositions of the slaveholders. License is the opposite of libertarian liberty. To free a slave is not to take any libertarian liberty from the slave owner. The, the, uh, Zwilinski is in a hole about slave owners, but digging continues. Before abolition, this always means I'm quoting, uh, before abolition, the law allowed them to do certain things. After abolition, it didn't. The slave owner's freedom has been reduced. The slave owner's power to restrict the liberty of others, i.e. to proactively impose on those others, has been reduced. They are not thereby themselves proactively or aggressively imposed on. Zwilinski explains that freedom is one thing, Justice is another. The correct response is that freedom from any constraint whatsoever is one thing. Freedom from interpersonal aggression or libertarian liberty is another, and justice is a third. And Zwilinski doesn't understand these distinctions. We are then asked, what is the unit of freedom on which our operation of addition and subtraction are to be performed. To answer this, we are told to consider the example from the philosopher Will Kimlicher's uh, critique of libertarianism. First, suppose we want to compare the freedom of people in London with those of people in pre-1989 communist Albania. People in London have freedoms like the right to vote. But political voting is not a freedom but an attempt to oppress others in a majoritarian way. He continues, and the right to practice their religion and other civil liberties and democratic liberties. Uh, but these are also dubious, as many so-called civil and democratic liberties are licenses posing as liberties. Anyway, the essay concludes that Albania's lack of traffic regulations does not compensate for the lack of basic civil liberties, but the question is, can we account for this judgment simply in terms of a quantitative judgment about the amount of freedom in Albania compared to London? And I say, yes, we can, but it is a rough and ready quantity rather than a precise unit. One can often see that one object is bigger than another or further away, etc., without being able to give any exact figures. And one can often do the same with liberty. One test of ordinal liberty is, in the current case, incidentally, is the direction of migration. If it is allowed, uh, people tend to move away from areas of greater oppression to those of lesser oppression. Zwolinski asks, how would such a quantitative judgment be made? 
And the answer is by starting with a libertarian theory of liberty instead of confusing it with freedom from any constraints whatsoever, as Walensky does. The questions continue. Should we count up the individual particular action tokens? Or should we be counting more general action types? And just how are we supposed to individuate actions in order to add them up? Muddles about liberty aside, comparison of size simply does not entail the precise quantification that Zwilinski thinks it does. It is obvious that the Albanians had even less liberty than we had, and we can say this without having to assign numbers to the differences. In the same way that we might point out that we can see somebody else is in more pain than we are, but that doesn't mean that we have to be able to give a number to their pain or a number to our pain. The essay then changes tack and asks, why believe that all that matters in assessing the freedom of a country is the numerical quantity of freedom allowed and not the substantive quality of that freedom? And the error here is in failing to understand that the amount of the lack of freedom relates to the extent that some infringement matters to the victim. There is no full distinction between quantity and quality. Pushing a passing person into a lake uh, is a lesser infringement of their liberty than raping them if that person finds the latter to be worse. It is very odd of Zwolinski to conclude, having said all this, that libertarians are right to believe that freedom matters because he has no coherent theory of freedom or liberty to give us that we can say matters. And it is further confused to assert that morally a commitment to maximizing freedom is inconsistent with libertarians' proper concern for individual rights. So this is what he's now saying libertarians should be interested in, individual rights. But libertarianism is ipto, ipso facto primarily about protecting liberty. And therefore, other things being equal, more liberty is better than less liberty, and individual rights are a separate and at most a subsidiary matter. Liberty and property. It is stated that imposing limits on others' freedom is part of the point of private property. This again simply fails to distinguish undifferentiated constraints on people from aggressive or proactive constraints. The libertarian point of private property is that it minimizes aggressive or proactive constraints. Zwilinski accepts Hobbes' conception of freedom and concludes that peace, prosperity and stability are only achieved when each individual agrees to lay down some of this unlimited liberty and to respect the rights of others. Hobbesian freedom is about having unconstrained action and it clashes with similar freedom among other people. By contrast, Lockean liberty, though this is an idealization of Locke, Locke wasn't completely consistent on this, Lockean liberty is the absence of aggressive constraints and it does not clash with uh, similar liberty among other people. They are completely different things. Limiting Hobbesian freedom of action, that is also license, that is aggressive, is not limiting Lockean libertarian liberty. This is the distinction which Zwolinski needs but fails to grasp. The his non-libertarian analysis continues with the view that if all land is privately owned and all landowners have a right to say no to all non-landowners, then non-landowners are not equally free with landowners. They exist in a state of dependence, like feudal serfs, serfs or the most abject slaves. They live only by the consent of, of those in command. However, 
This consequence is easily avoided by understanding and applying the correct pre-propertarian libertarian theory of liberty. For to the extent that private property in land begins to proactively impose on non-landowners, it is thereby not libertarian. This is, of course, largely a theoretical possibility in the real world. The essay, uh, uh, Zwilinski's essay, then explicitly advocates G.A. Cohen's view of liberty that the poor lack precisely the kind of negative freedom that libertarians purport to be concerned with. Freedom from liability to physical interference by other human beings. This is completely and utterly mistaken. That is not the kind of freedom that clear thinking libertarians are concerned with. Libertarians are concerned with something more like people not being aggressively constrained by other people. And merely protecting one's non-aggressively acquired and held property is precisely not aggressively to impose on the liberty of others. More on property, freedom and coercion. Zwilinski then asks, why do I say that property rights limit freedom? I start with the belief that to be free is not to be subject to interference by other people. From a libertarian viewpoint, it would be clearer to say that to be free is not to be subject to aggressive interference by other people. And we then need an abstract theory of such aggressive interference, from which property is derivable. Instead, Zwolinski says, property rights are, to, at their very core, socially and legally enforceable licenses to interfere with others. If I have a property right in a piece of land, I get to physically interfere with anybody who tries to use that land without my consent or call the police to do the interfering for me. So my having a property right in the land limits your freedom to use it. Given that he accepts this conception of libertarianism, you wonder why he wants to call himself a libertarian. On the contrary, it would be more accurate to say that property rights are at their very core socially and legally enforceable claims to stop others interfering with us. If I have a property right in a piece of land, I get to physically defend myself from anybody who tries to use that land without my consent. So my pro having property rights in land limits something more like your Hobbesian freedom of action to use it and not your Lockean freedom from aggressive, aggressive interference. Against moralized freedom. We are invited to reconsider the view that it is only interference that violates its target's moral rights that counts as genuine infringement of freedom. And this view is then rejected one, because it conflicts with at least a significant part of our ordinary usage of the term, or two, because of circularity. We have the rights we have because they protect freedom, and freedom is the liberty to do the sorts of things we have the, rights, the, the right to do. Or three, due to divorcing rights for, from concerns about liberty as non-interference altogether. Now, the first point was dealt with earlier. The second two points do have some cogency, but they are not the underlying problem here. The real problem here is that it greatly confuses matters to conflate one, an objective theory of libertarian liberty as the absence of aggression, and two, whether there is a moral right to such liberty, however it might be formulated. Admittedly, it is a common confusion among libertarians. A lot of the criticisms that Zwilinski has are problems for a lot of people who call themselves libertarians. I don't deny that. Uh, so in that sense, Zwilinski is not attacking a straw man. There is an army of these people who call themselves libertarians who cannot answer Zwilinski. <coughs> I'm 
I'll skip over the bit about um, justification of property because that deals with epistemology and it's a separate argument, but Smolinski talks about how property can be justified and I'd, ultimately I don't think it can be justified, it's just that it's a good thing and there's no good reason why it isn't, so it's a conjectural approach. And we'll go on to libertarianism and pollution. Zwolitski first tells us that libertarians generally believe that aggression against innocent persons is morally wrong and that the only just use of violence is to prevent aggression by others. The essay then says, in this respect at least, the liberal egalitarian philosopher John Rawls was on precisely the same page as libertarian colleague Robert Nozick. And he quotes John Rawls on freedom, uh, apparently to this effect. However, this overlooks that Rawls has an understanding of freedom which is inherently political and therefore its superficial equivalence. We are soon then asked by Zwolinski, suppose I aggress against you uh, not by beating you over the head with a club, but by blowing tobacco smoke in your face. The smoke blowing, just like the clubbing, is a physical invasion of your property, and it is a harmful invasion. After such considerations, we reach the conclusion that the consistent application of Rothbard's absolutist principle of non-aggression thus seems to require a prohibition on all forms of non-consensual pollution. And in its absolutist form, this is correct. However, this conclusion overlooks something crucially important that uh, aggression cuts both ways. The enforcement of the prohibition of pollution would ag aggress against the people whose activities would produce the pollution. For instance, having fires for needed warmth and cooking. So such prohibitions cannot be allowed either. We have reached not one, but two unacceptable conclusions. Uh, both that uh, people cannot be allowed to pollute and they cannot be prevented from polluting. Hence, that form of the theory must be refuted. There are two main problems with the absolutist theory that lead to this result. First, while liberty itself can be interpreted as the absence of aggression, the libertarian policy must be to minimize aggression when there is such a clash as that described. Some people need fires for cooking and other people don't like the smoke. Some compromise is going to be necessary. Aggression, understood in terms of violating property rights, is only a rule of thumb. Aggression can be more abstractly and abs accurately theorised as proactively imposing costs on other people. And this then uh, solves the problems of how to deal with clashing impositions. Six reasons libertarians should regret, reject the non-aggression principle. This is uh, Zwolinski's um, naughtiest part of his essays. And normally I wouldn't defend the non-aggression principle because I think it's slightly vague. But when I read Zwolinski's attack, I, I thought, well, it's not that bad. Uh, perhaps I, I'll defend it from his attack. Uh, so I have done here. Uh, Zwolinski begins, many libertarians believe that the whole of their political philosophy can be summed up in a single simple principle, the non-aggression principle. Uh, now, as I have argued, the non-aggression principle on its own is no good because it is absolutist and there's a problem with an absolutist principle. When, there are, when there's a clash of aggressions, 
we have to resort to the minimization of aggressions. If whatever happens, I impose on you or you impose on me, then we have to say, what compromise can we reach which minimizes this conflict? Therefore, we have to have the minimization of aggression principle, the MAP, rather than just the non-aggression principle or NAP. Zwolinski continues that the NAP holds that aggression against the, uh, uh, the person or property of others is always wrong. Except that we, we've seen it often is inevitable and some compromise is necessary. What is the philosophical significance of the fact that, on its face, the non-aggression principle's prohibition of aggression falls nicely in line with common sense? Common sense is a fallacious criterion of truth or morality. So it is similarly irrelevant to say that it is far from common sense to think that its badness is absolute. But it is relevant to present any other possible considerations of justice or political morality as a crit criticism of the NAP conjecture. I'm skipping ahead a bit here. Yep. Anyway, we're now quickly going to run through his six reasons for rejecting the non-aggression principle. One prohibits all pollution. Sorry? Prohibits all pollution, the non-aggression principle. This section asserts that industrial pollution violates the NAP and must therefore be prohibited. Moreover, even personal pollution produced by driving, burning wood in one's fireplace, smoking, etc., runs afoul of the NAP. As has already been explained, prohibiting pollution, for instance, for needed warmth or uh, uh, fire for needed warmth or cooking also violates the NAP, hence the map comes into play, so that criticism doesn't work. Two, prohibit small harms for large benefits. Uh, theoretically, you could achieve some wonderful things by violating people's liberties, according to... Uh, Zwolinski. Uh, in particular, you know, tax people just a little bit of money and maybe you can cure cancer or whatever, you know, come up with a virus to cure some other terrible disease. And he says, libertarianism says this can't be allowed. You know, why shouldn't we do it really? My answer to this is this is completely, uh, this is an argument from logical possibility. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you don't need to tax people in order to come up with improvements in medicine. And as soon as you start to tax people, you are killing the goose that lays the golden egg. You're stopping people producing so much wealth, and some of that wealth would have gone into medicine and would have gone into cures and so on and so forth. Uh, it's merely a logical possibility that by taxing people just a little bit, we can make the world better. We don't have to deny it's logically possible. The fact that is, it doesn't seem to be the case that taxing people does improve the world. So it's irrelevant that it's logically possible that it could. Three, an all for nothing attitude, all or nothing attitude towards risk. The question posed is, what if I merely run the risk of shooting you by putting a bullet in a six shot revolver spinning the cylinder, aiming it at your head, and squeezing the trigger. Uh, now, Zwolinski thinks, if you do that to someone and you don't shoot them, then that's fine. But of course, it isn't fine, because that's taking a risk at somebody's expense. And to take a risk like that at somebody else's expense imposes a cost on them, is, is an aggression against them. You are uh, assuming that you 
have a claim against them to take this risk. The extent of the damage that you're doing them will be, in monetary terms, roughly how much you'd have to pay them to take such a risk, whether or not you actually do end up shooting them. So there isn't this all or nothing attitude towards risk in libertarianism, it's simply a mistake. Four, no prohibition of fraud. Zwolinski thinks that fraud doesn't fit in with the idea that there shouldn't be violence. It, this is true, fraud doesn't fit in, but then uh, this is simply a confusion about what libertarianism is about. Libertarianism is not about the absence of violence, the word that Zwolinski uses here. It's, a, it's about the absence of aggression. Now, uh, fraud is an aggression because it violates the property rights that, the, that any relevant agreement establishes. If I say, if you do that, I will give you this, you then do that and I don't give you this, I've aggressed against the property that I've already, in principle, ceded to you. All the talk of violence is confused. There is a, a, a libertarian reason for, for prohibiting fraud. Five, it's parasitic on a theory of property. Now, this is quite interesting. Uh, <clears throat> like many of the uh, criticisms, this works against certain kinds of libertarian. Certain kinds of libertarian have a theory of property, and whenever they say something is aggressive, they mean it violates property in this sense. But he says, well, if they mean it violates property in this sense, then what you really are is a propertarian. You're, you have a theory of property, and you think that violating that is wrong, but why are you calling yourself a libertarian? You ought to be calling yourself a propertarian. Uh, that's the gist of the criticism here. I think that's a good criticism, in principle. Uh, but then libertarians don't need to do everything in terms of property because they can derive their theory of property from their theory of liberty. Certain forms of property will respect liberty. In particular, self-ownership and private property that you acquire whereby you're not being a nuisance to anybody else. Uh, such forms of property generally promote liberty and therefore you're not assuming a theory of property and then doing everything in terms of that. You're assuming liberty, then deriving self-ownership and property. And then you can say, that's why it's wrong to interfere with somebody because ultimately you're interfering with their liberty. So that, I think, that argument doesn't work either. Finally, he says, what about the children? And he gives the Rothbard's example that you have a right to uh, sort of starve your child if you wish. And I think the confusion here is simply that uh, to put yourself in a position of looking after somebody means that you thereby take it upon yourself certain duties that you have to fulfill. It's like becoming <coughs> um, an attendant in a swimming pool. If you take the job as uh, an attendant in a swimming pool, say, you know, you can help anybody who's in trouble, and then you see somebody's drowning in the water, you do nothing. It, uh, what you're actually doing, it, even though you're physically doing nothing, you're actually breaking the contract that you have to help them in the water. Similarly, if you take on the support of a child, you are implicitly saying, I will look after that child. You can't say, I will look after the child and then lock it in a cupboard and not feed it. Uh, that is actually an aggressive act. It's not merely the act of not feeding the child. If you didn't want to look after the child, you shouldn't have uh, uh, taken that on board in the first place. Having taken on board that um, duty, you have to discharge the duty or disperse your duty by giving it to somebody else. So that final criticism I don't think works very well either. The essay's concluding sentence, this is Zwolinski's concluding sentence, there are about six or seven essays that he has on libertarianism.org. 
is that libertarianism needs its own Copernican revolu revolution. The analogy is more apposite than is implied. For the Copernican revolution that is possible here is to stop trying to theorize non-aggression or liberty, ultimately in terms of legitimate property, and do the reverse, to theorize legitimate property ultimately in terms of non-aggression or liberty. And with this approach, all six given reasons to reject the non-aggression principle can be comprehensively refuted. Yet this Copernican revolution is viewed as heretical uh, by many libertarians, where it has been noticed at all. And the heresy is compounded by the incomprehensible uh, rejection of the supposed justification in favour of the application of a critical rationalist epistemology. Consequently, it might be useful to conclude by emphasising that this revolution is not a criticism of libertarianism as such, nor is it any kind of compromise with non-libertarian principles, as many Rothbardians see it. On the contrary, it's supposed to clarify and unify much currently diverse libertarian theory behind a single principle of liberty itself. Liberty has to be at the heart of libertarianism, an objective theory of liberty, not a theory of property, not a theory of duty or rights, or not, a, not even really a theory of non-aggression. What, what on earth are you doing talking about aggression? If you say liberty matters and then you start talking about non-aggression, what's that got to do with liberty? They never say. They say, they say somehow they think it's, it's, it's clear. When you push them, they then do what Swalinski says they do, they start coming up with a theory of property, which they then also can't relate to liberty. So, uh, to conclude then, uh, what Zwolinski has found in the literature, but mainly in Will Kimlicker, his attitude is more or less what Kimlicker says. Not, there's not much come from anywhere else. Is He's seen there are a lot of good criticisms of philosophically unsophisticated libertarianism and he's embraced them completely and says, yes, libertarian th philosophy is a mess uh, for all these reasons. And a lot of people's libertarian philosophy is a mess. However, I think all of those criticisms can easily be answered uh, and uh, we can get out of that mess in the sorts of ways that I've outlined. And uh, we not only can we get out of that mess, we need to get out of that mess because without it, we have this horrible mess which Zwolinski is in, whereby he says, he starts talking about the freedom of the slave owner. He said, the freedom of the slave owner. The, the freedom of the slave owner, is it equal to the freedom of the slave? And yet he says, we want to increase freedom. Do we want to increase the freedom of the slave owner? If not, why not? I mean, it, what he, his position is completely incoherent. So. He philosophically rejects libertarianism. He's not a libertarian anyway. Uh, the only uh, reason that he thinks he's a libertarian is he's read lots of the economics and he quite likes it. You know, he sees that libertarianism is efficient from an economic point of view, in particular uh, David Friedman and so on. Uh, so that's why he calls himself a libertarian, because David Friedman calls himself a libertarian, though David Friedman has got no philosophical clue what libertarianism is all about, and he's simply got a lot of criticisms of uh, libertarian philosophy. And he's in, in his book, Machinery of Freedom, he says libertarian philosophy makes no sense. He, you know, uh, uh, but I can only do the economics. You see? Uh, so we shouldn't embrace uh, Zwolinski's utter confusion and despair at the philosophy, it's necessary that we try to answer the questions, it's necessary that we don't simply fall back on the economics, but it's very easy to answer these questions, it's very easy to get out of the sort of confusions that Zwolinski has got into following Kimlicker and Cohen and uh, various other critics of libertarianism. Thank you. Any questions, Michael? Yeah, thank you for the talk. I
you have a question, really, it's not a criticism that you brought up, but um, it is relevant, I think. It's, you were discussing the idea of uh, a country and freedom relative to country. Yeah. Serena Olseretti, in the book Liberty Desert the Market, 2004, um, has an interesting thought experiment. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but uh, she utilizes it on cities, but you could use it on countries as well. Yeah. Her idea is she creates two cities. She creates a, um, a desert city and a wired city. And she basically says, imagine you're in a city that's covered by wire. You know, by barbed wire, you can't get out. So she says, you're not free to leave. Yeah. So therefore, under a libertarian conception, she says, you are not free to leave. Even if you want to stay there, you're quite happy from a quality point of view to stay there, you are not free. Yeah. But then she creates another city. She says it's a desert city. So you're, there is no, you're only bounded by nature. You're a city in the middle of a desert. You are free to leave, but if you walked out, if you walked out of the city, you would die in the desert. Yeah. She says from a libertarian conception, you are not free to leave. You, you are free to leave. He said, but if you didn't want to stay in the city, because you, you, because you didn't really want to be there, you would die. So effectively, she, 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 she attacks the idea of, uh, of freedom and voluntariness. And she says that this, this concept where you libertarians get wrong. And I think it's, a, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting attack that she makes. Uh, when, when, she says, when she says, by the libertarian conception, what does she, what does she... I mean, she's generally attacking those people. To be fair. Oh right, yeah. But, I mean, that's what, often people think that, that, that they just identify. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think the, the point comes down to is yeah. if you are if you are saying, well, what does freedom mean? And if, you, if freedom mean, if you're saying that the only thing it's attacking if you are arrested against, or like if you are put in a city by barbed wire, you're arrested. Yeah. You know, you are you are physically yeah. restrained. Yeah. Yeah. Says, if you are bound just by nature, then yeah. then you're yeah. not. Then there yeah. is no. No one yeah, so, you see, but I think this is, I mean, this overlooks the fundamental idea of it, that it's, it's to do with interpersonal constraints. Libertarian liberty is only about interpersonal constraints, it's nothing to do with nature. It's if you did something to me, which uh, somehow imposes upon me, uh, 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 then you've interfered with my liberty. If a tree falls on me and breaks my leg, my liberty hasn't been interfered with in the interpersonal sense. Libertarianism is about interpersonal liberty. It's not about nature. It simply isn't. Now, you might say other kinds of liberty matter. Yeah, they do. But that's not what libertarianism is about. I mean, there are all kinds of things that matter that libertarianism isn't about. Libertarianism is how should human beings interact with each other. And it says, put somewhat crudely, without philosophically unpacking it, they should interact voluntarily without uh, uh, you know, simply imposing things on each other without agreement or unless it's done in self-defense or whatever. Uh, but it's sort, of, it's sort of irrelevant to say, suppose nature was configured in such a way that you were equally constrained. Well, so what? I mean, that's, that's a bizarre thought experiment that is irrelevant to the idea that human beings ought to interact voluntarily as far as possible. I think, I think the point that she was trying to make yeah. you know, was that uh, libertarians, she was arguing, and I think she was referring to noting, but, you know, in general, was that libertarians define freedom in terms of voluntariness, voluntariness in terms of freedom. And she was... Well, no, no well... She's saying, she's saying it's a very circular argument. Oh, there are circular... Uh, there's uh, circularity. Uh, I don't deny there's circularity. The, I mean, mo most criticisms I read of libertarianism are, are sound criticisms of some, if not most, libertarians. Uh, it's just that I have a particular libertarian theory that I think answers it, and therefore it doesn't cut the ice with, cut the ice with me. It's irrelevant. And there is circularity... I mean, in particular, the, the circularity is, a, a, is the proprietarian one. They define liberty in a certain kind of property, but they don't have any way of explaining why that property promotes liberty. They simply have a, a, an intuition. And, uh, so they're philosophically... Uh, uh, they have nothing beyond that intuition, uh, uh, which is, is a very weak position to be in when it comes to their philosophical critics, which exist, and they need to have... make the they need to be able to explain clearly how self-ownership and physical property are the best ways of minimising people's interference with each other and thereby maximising liberty. Once you realise that they're derivable from 
a pre-propertarian conception of liber abstract liberty as people not interfering with each other. That's the abstract theory, put simply, people shouldn't interfere with each other. From that, self-ownership follows. From that, private property is a way of minimizing that follows. Once you've got that theory straight, you, you're not in circularity anymore. You've got a derivation of self-ownership and property. And if there's ever a problem case, such as somebody buys all the land around where I live, can they stop me getting out? You go back to the pre propertarian theory and say, no, they can't, because that would be being a nuisance to you when you've done nothing to them. They have to give you uh, rights of access um, uh, or otherwise they are uh, aggressively imposing on you by the pre propertarian theory but we can go back to that and we don't have circularity anymore we don't have circularity because we put liberty at the heart of libertarianism instead of something else now non-aggression comes close to being good enough but the trouble is most people who talk about non-aggression talk about it in this circular way and therefore that's no good. And as soon as you try and explain non-aggression, you might as well start talking about liberty itself because why are you talking about non-aggression? Why don't you just say what liberty is? Why, to say liberty is non-aggression. Why? What, what, in what way is liberty non-aggression? Be clear. Spell it out. They can't. Or they simply, uh, Lou, Rock, uh, Lou Rockwell, Walter Block, you know, all of them. You know, liberty is non-aggression. What do you mean? Liberty is non-aggression. I mean, it's just bizarre that they, they, they can't see that, 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 that they're relying on an intuition here without any clear theory of, of, of liberty. I mean, uh, uh, there is a sense in which it's true, but they can't spell it out because they are locked into this sort of cycle of... of, of it's more or less a language game, unfortunately. Uh, they do have genuine libertarian intuitions. They have, a, they have a sense of what liberty is that I agree with. They can't put it into words. And then they've got a language game, way of dealing with uh, non-aggression, private property rights, and they muddle it all together in a way that I hate and any philosopher ought to hate. Is you sh if you're trying to work out what liberty is, you should stop talking about people's rights. Because whether people have rights to liberty must be a completely separate thing from what liberty is. First, you've got to be able to say what it is. A separate question is, is it a good thing? Should, do people have rights to it? What those rights are? These are all separate things, but most people conflate them all together. Libertarians conflate them together, and that's why a lot of what they write, it seems so clear to them, because they're immersed in the language game like you know, Catholics speaking about the original sin or that's, uh, that, that's the way we talk and you know you join the game or you leave the game and then you see people joining and leaving Gene Callahan for instance he joins and leaves libertarianism without ever really understanding it he doesn't understand it because most of the people who are libertarianism who are libertarians don't understand it they're philosophically utterly muddled and it, it's acutely ironic that uh, that almost no libertarians have a theory of liberty I'm a libertarian I'm, uh, uh, let, let me explain and then I'll talk about anything except liberty uh, it's a very very weak position to be in and it's completely unnecessary but uh, I might read this uh, what was her name again Serena Polseretti she was uh, Jerry Cohen's PhD student. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm not yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, but, yeah just, yeah, just, but Cohen is clueless. When it, I'm completely and utterly clueless on this. I, Americans often defer to Cohen. I don't, they defer to... There's an awful lot of uh, academic snobbery in America, as far as I can uh, see. They, they, they just love people who sort of, you know, they're at Harvard, they're at Oxford, you know. Who cares? The arguments are crap. It doesn't matter where they are. If the argument doesn't work, the argument doesn't work. Anyway, sorry. Paul. Yeah, I'm dismayed to learn that Christina Alteretti thinks that my ability that I can't simply leave the Earth and float off to Mars because of the vacuum of space stopping my liberty. 
Well, it's a kind of liberty, <laughs> physical liberty. <laughs> exactly. It's a physical the liberty. The same as city in the desert, then. I was just, yeah. I'm also worried that I'm going to have to sell back those 200 slaves I bought on the internet from Nigeria the other week. That, uh, no. You too. <laughs> I'm still waiting for mine to be delivered. That's where libertarianism leads to. It's the commodification of everything, and next thing, people will be buying and selling slaves. Now, now I know that, uh, that owning slaves isn't a, a liberty. Uh, but the, the odd thing is that, um, what's good thing is that people like Rockwell and um, Block and Rothbard and people like that, um, they're philosophically unsophisticated. They're People might think they're economically unsophisticated as well, but they're philosophically unsophisticated. But they do seem to have... Um, so are all the oh, American philosophers. I, sorry. <laughs> but they do seem to have more of an intuitive grasp of what libertarian liberty entails, rather than the libertarian philosophers, who yeah. can see that the economists are going wrong philosophically. Uh, but then, they, and, and they're right to, yeah, they're right to see that what's wrong with the uh, non-aggression principle and its proprietarianism and things like that. They make the same correct. Um, but the, 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 the people in America Sophisticated, such as uh, Roderick Long, he's probably about the best of them, I think, and as Wolinsky in that. They, they criticise, but they don't have any, as you say, any better theory, but they, uh, there seems to be a lot of the philosophically sophisticated ones making it even worse, and uh, they come up with all sorts of silly deviations, just thickness and thinness, and mix it in with social justice, and all, uh, they accept all the politically correct agenda on the one hand, or yeah. you know, some of them, or conservative agenda on the other hand, if they're Hopper or and others of them as well, they try to splice the things, and there's Rockwell and Block are trying to sort of hold up the lines, and no, no, this is what, no, but it's, you're all wrong about all of that, this is what libertarianism is, but, and they try to get what their intuitive idea is down. Mm. They always amount to the non-aggression principle of proprietarianism. And that's still, that's still, and that doesn't impress the, the, the philosophers. And um, I, I've read quite a lot of the, the libertarians, but I've, it's difficult to think of anybody who is philosophically sophisticated in America who has a better grasp of intuitive grasp of liberty than, than, than Block and Rothbard. I think they're probably doing a better job, despite their lack of philosophical sophistication. And it's, it's a shame that they're so arrogant, they won't listen to you. <coughs> and they to... Well, I mean... I, I think your, re your reformulation or defence of the non-aggression principle is actually probably the best bit of your essay. Yeah. It's there, actually. It's, it's worth a while. Well, I mean, it, it, it was... Really it, skewered. It, yeah, I mean, that was... That's, I mean, it, he got me... I mm. thought, well, if Zwilinski thinks this is hopeless, perhaps there's something in it after all. Yeah. <laughs> so, and and I thought, yeah, you can easily... You can you can reformulate it charitably. And, uh, yeah, it's this... It, it, you can do it, but it's... It just it's useful to relate it to liberty rather than simply leave it on its own. I I'm a libertarian, I believe in non-aggression. What's that got to do with liberty? Mm. Shut up, he explained. <laughs> <laughs> Let me talk about rights or something, anything. But I'm not going to talk about liberty. I don't want to talk about liberty. They don't have a problem. Now, uh, very, very occasionally they, 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 they do, but it's uh, uh, when they do, it's usually much later in the game when they're talking about freedom of speech or something like that. So whereby, as a background assumption, we've got self-ownership, private property, and so forth. And then within that framework, uh, how do we deal with uh, freedom of communication and so forth? And then what they say is often very sensible and their arguments are good and their way of defending it is good. But the, it's uh, you've got to... Uh, uh, get over the problem of the, the, what they're saying fundamentally is incoherent to people who do want to understand. I mean, critics of libertarianism, when they say, you know, this doesn't make sense, they're not just ridiculing libertarianism, they genuinely see there's a problem here. And you said Long is sophisticated, but Long doesn't see the problem. No, 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 no. He, 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 he just... thinks, he said, obvious. We're just against aggression. Yeah. Can't you see that? He's just, and then he, he, he goes through this derivation of whatever, and he's just, and basically he's got a proprietarian theory in terms of which uh, we're against aggression. So how does that theory of property relate to liberty? He's got nothing to say. 
So the, I don't see any great sophistication in it. No, it's probably, uh, I think, I the, mean, thing, the thing my, lo my long scenes better is that he's a bit of a natural diplomat and he tries to keep friendly with them all. And so he, he's quite good at diplomatically finessing the difference. Well, he's certainly you know, good in, in his yeah. own mind. And, and, yeah. uh, that, and so that's why he seems more reasonable from that point of view. Uh, I mean, the reason Rothbard is so enormously popular and successful is people read him and they can see what he's on about, despite the fact that it's incoherent. They can see what he's getting at yes. uh, and they agree with it. Yeah. And they agree with the upshot and the implications. Uh, then people criticise it philosophically, correctly. Uh, they're right to do that. But, um, but they then just end up making more of a difficult off-putting mess. You know, it's a, you know, I don't quite know why Zwolitsky well, sees himself as a libertarian since he accepts all what Kimmich can say. And, and what is it? What, what are the good bits he thinks are in, in libertarian? I see, I, I, well, oh, no, <laughs> no, no. I mean, if he's, if he's silly, no, he, he thinks he's a libertarian because of people like David Friedman who call themselves a libertarian. And he sees, he, he understands uh, some of the economics. Not enough to make him a private property anarchist, but enough of the economics to not be, uh, you know, uh, resort to the state to, for welfare at every turn. Uh, and for that, he calls it. But it's very, very odd to say, to talk about the freedom of the slave owner, and then say, and then say, I'm in favour of. Of course, I'm in favour of liberty. What, what? What do you mean? You just, you've just explained how the idea makes no sense, and now you're saying that you're in favour of it. You're in favour of this idea that makes no sense. How could you say you're in favour of it? You should be saying, I'm against it. <laughs> it makes no sense. But the economics are good. But of course, that's exactly what David Friedman says. Like I made no philosophical sense of it, but the economics work. And, he, and I agree the economics work. Yeah. But the, other, the other glaring error in Paulo's Kimlicker is that they, they see that, um, re, they, they, as you can say, they, they can look at Britain and Albania and see that one is on the whole freer than the other. Yeah. And you look at the world, and one thing you notice is that the countries that are a bit freer tend on the whole to practice uh, democracy. And so then they make the error, oh, yeah. assuming that democracy has got something to do or is essential with or is the same as liberty. And so they say silly things like, you know, you know we've got the freedom to vote. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that's... Well, when you don't have a theory of... Yeah. proper theory of freedom or liberty at all, then you just can throw it in at any point. Call it... At least... At least he's consistent, it, because most people would, if they don't like it, they'd say, oh, I don't, I don't like that, so I'm not going to call that liberty, but I like that, so I'll call that liberty, whatever it is. Mm. Uh, but I, uh, it just amazes me that they can so not care to be able to make sense of the principles which ought to be at the heart of what they say they believe. As, uh, I suppose it isn't that they don't care. Uh, they 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 don't they don't see their confusion. That's simply it. They just because of Kimlicka, Zwolinski sees the confusion that is in a lot of libertarianism. A lot of those libertarians don't see the confusion, uh, uh, and therefore it's yeah. They, they think, why well, can't people understand what you're saying is so plain? No, it's not plain. There's real philosophical problems in what you're saying. However, really quite easy to sort them out. Uh, there's not much to it, really. Well, I say there's not much to it. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I spit like, that's like saying there's not much to critical rationalism or uh, falsificationism. Uh, uh, some people can't see a problem with induction. Uh, some people can see that there's a problem with induction, but, but they simply can't understand how there could possibly be any kind of a solution. You know, so that's at the next stage. I suppose uh, Zwolinski is at the stage of understanding that there really is a problem with induction. We can't have it, but he can't see any way 
what any way out of the uh, out the disaster. So, uh, so, so it's like somebody saying, "Well, we, I can make no sense of induction, but we do it anyway," which is more or less what Hume said. Uh, you know, uh, so it doesn't make any sense, but we do it and we get by, so that's okay. So. Swinitsky says, I can't really make any sense of liberty, but liberty matters. You can't make any sense of it. How can you, how can you affirm that it matters? No. Rank, confusion. I suppose he's less confused. At least he's less confused than the people who don't realize there's any problem at all. At least he sees some of the problems. So that's progress. So, uh, uh, you get some marks for that. Is there anyone else who wants to say something? You've stunned them into silence, Jan. I suppose we can continue the non-discussion over a point of Okay. <laughs>